We're going to welcome our panelists to the stage shortly. Chris Benderev was a founding producer, as you know, of this embedded podcast. In his dozen years at NPR, he was also a producer for Weekend Edition and an occasional reporter of arts, science, and breaking news story. He is currently a producer with This American Life. Kelly McEvers, now front row. the creator and host of this award-winning podcast, is a two-time Peabody Award-winning journalist and former host of NPR's flagship news magazine, All Things Considered. She spent much of her career as an international correspondent reporting from Asia, the former Soviet Union, and the Middle East. Celine San Felice is now a reporter at Axios, writing the Tampa Bay newsletter. She, along with her colleagues at the paper, received a Pulitzer Prize special citation and were Time Magazine's Persons of the Year for 2018. Rupa Shinoy is WBUR's Morning Edition host. She is our moderator this evening. Formerly, she was a reporter for WGBH's The World and host of their Otherwise podcast. Let me welcome you to the stage. Hi, everybody. Hello. Thank Hi. you so much for being. Wow, there's a lot of you. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much for being here. I want to first say this was an amazing accomplishment. I mean, uh, the, the quality of the writing, the quality of the sound, the way that it flowed, it was, it's, it's an accomplishment. Can, would you guys mind? Have you already clapped? Would you mind clapping again? Like, this was. This is, I mean, it's, it's really good work. Thank you. Yeah. I'm jealous. Uh, you're looking at me. It was not just radio. It was actually a team sport. It doesn't seem like <laughs> it, but other people help. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so um, you guys have not been back together <laughs> since this happened, since you recorded this, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think the last time I saw you was the sentencing. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. So summer 2021, mm -hmm. yeah. So how does it feel? Uh, it's, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, feel, I feel good. I feel honestly like I am in a much different mood than everybody else is here. <laughs> yes. um, I'm like up here because I have, you know, been so excited to, like I didn't get to officially meet you in person until right now and, yeah. and um, you know, see Chris again, and my colleagues from the Capitol are here, and um, so we're having our reunion. <laughs> um, so I'm in reunion mode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and Chris and I, since that series, have kind of gone on to do different things, of course, mm -hmm. as you do. Um, but yeah, this is the first time we met in person, which is yeah. amazing. And the first time we made the first phone call is about doing this series. You said you were loud, but now you're not. Oh, oh sorry. You're right. I know. It's okay. intense. We just heard that episode. I know. I'm sorry. No. We didn't. Okay. Uh, the, yeah, you and right. Selena, it's also like a mood difference. Yeah. I just yeah, want to exactly. say it's like a yeah. big thing to lay out on everyone on a Friday night. Woo. But yeah. Yeah. thank you all. Yeah. I, we should say, I mean, the most important thing here is feelings and especially feelings of the victims. So if anyone feels uncomfortable about what we're talking about, you know, do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And if I'm involved, please tell me. <laughs> um, at, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about this because I know how, am I right? Putting something out like this can feel like giving birth. Mm. And it can just be a long emotional process. Yes, though there's like a caveat to that answer because my wife was actually pregnant, like right <laughs> when we were finishing this. Like she built the crib 
eight months pregnant because I was working on this. <laughs> so that's like not a, not a high point as a husband, <laughs> I know. Um, it's not quite like that. Um, but it is a very long and like arduous process, I think, to make a story like this. Yeah, and I think it's, um, it's all about the power of doing documentary type work, long form narrative work. Um, the first step is, of course, the care um, and just letting people know that you're going to take the time and the care yeah. to tell their story. Um, and Chris, you know, I'm going to toot your horn here on that because, and Celine, you can jump in here because you were the person who was being reported on. Um, that's a thing that we just kind of said that we were going to do from the beginning, right, was I remember the early phone calls, you know, it took a long time before we really started to actually dig in and do formal reporting. I think there were just like a lot of conversations about what is this going to be? What do you guys want to accomplish? What are you not going to do? What are you going to do? Um, how are we collectively going to tell this story? And I think when you're doing a documentary project like this, it's that's just super important. Um, and so any long form project feels like you know giving birth, but this one in particular, um, because we were collaborating with the people that we were reporting on from the beginning. Um, that's just going to take some time. So is the beginning Chris seeing Celine on CNN? Yes. That was like the first thing I saw about, about, the, about the shooting. But then it was, and Danielle, who's in the audience here. Also Danielle, oh my God. What, uh, what? Honestly, it was <sighs> talking about it then with Kelly and some other people we were working with. And our, we were very interested and we reached out. And honestly, the higher ups involved, for understandable reasons, were like not interested in making the oh the yeah right away. Um, and then I, but I did start separate conversations with Celine and Danielle, and Danielle. kind of off the record coffees, just driving out to Annapolis. They were saying no. What to your pitches? Were you, was it a, like a formal pitch? Oh yeah. Yeah. That was like we had to. We, and they were involved at one point. Like it was. We were supposed to. I remember because I had to do a lot of these phone calls. It was like call the press person at the Baltimore Sun which, Business which Office dot corp yeah. dot co whoever it was. <laughs> I don't know. No, I remember. I think who it was. But it was like long yeah, emails and like phone be. calls, <laughs> and they were like, we don't know if this is the right thing to do. You know, it was the usual kind of thing, right? Um, with that you get as journalists but, when you're trying to do a story, you got to go through the. The, the gatekeepers, and the gatekeepers were not super excited about this. But I, I don't know, I'd like, what, you were on the other end of that, like me coming out and talking to you a lot and seeing, I don't know, what was that? Uh, yeah, we had a lot of people approaching us uh, who wanted to be with us for a long time and tell our story, because um, all of us who, who sort of spoke out after, uh, and I especially wanted to make it clear that like, everyone was gonna forget about us. And that um, just like every other mass shooting, people were gonna move on. And I think it hit with other journalists really hard that they wanted to make sure that that wasn't gonna happen. Um, but you can't say yes to every single organization that wants to follow you long term. Um, so, you know, we did have to make a choice, but also, you know, I think there was a protectiveness of us and wanting to make sure that whoever was going to tell our story was going to be sensitive. And then, of course, we are journalists. And so there was some consideration of, can we tell our own story in this way? Can we do this like long form and long term? And we said no. Like All of us involved said no, because we're already doing our reporting. Like I can't be doing both. And also then, when we realized we wanted our story to be told really well, um, Danielle was mobilizing the union, and then we were like the NPR union also, like trying what do you to mean? get this. We, I mean, it was the same. We would like log off of work, um, finish our work, and then have like union calls, union meetings, and then also like have calls with Chris and Kelly and try and get this worked out with the company. Ju it was just it was just like the stuff we were doing for the union. All while, you know, surviving, getting through, working through your own, yeah. 
just day-to-day -day life, which was a whole thing. In and living the luxurious, well-heeled life <laughs> of a local newspaper <laughs> reporter. Yeah, of course. Right. Yeah. Does How did you decide on Chris and Kelly? Uh, honestly, like, we sort of figured out, like, there were different options of, could we do video documentary? Like, what was it going to be? And I think we decided, like, we wanted to do a podcast. And then there was, of course, well, you know, what if we just got microphones and did it ourselves and, like, paid someone to stitch it all together? And, and the reporters were like, no, 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 no. That's not what we do. We are newspaper writers. Uh, and so when we saw that Embedded was approaching us, we were like, well, that is what they do best. Um, and we want them to be long term, like with us. And that is what happened. Like, I did not expect you to spend two years with yeah. us. They I didn't are expect a lot. Either, I, don't I think. know. Yeah. yeah, I was there a lot. Mm -hmm. um, Once they, yeah, it was like nine months of probably going back and forth before, for good reason. Like Rick, who you don't hear so much uh, in the first episode, he was the editor, editor in chief, really, even though that wasn't his official role. Uh, he was the one I ended up talking with the most, mm -hmm. and then having more coffees with him. And he was just honest about, like, I think because you guys, I don't think it would have happened at all if Celine and Danielle and a couple other people, like Josh, um, had, hadn't been on board. And then they were kind of pressuring Rick, and Rick was like, maybe, but they were, you guys were in a very small temporary newsroom before you found a new newsroom, and there's more to that story if you want to go ahead and listen. But, um, but it was so small, Rick was just like, fine, you can talk to people, but f until we get the new newsroom, like it's just too small to have, and everyone here is just too traumatized to have someone like hovering around with a microphone, which totally made sense. So in the beginning, I just interviewed people who were open to it, like outside of the newsroom. And then eventually, once they moved into a new newsroom, then I was there like a, a lot. I live in DC, kind of about like a 45 minute drive away. And uh, yeah. What, were you just hanging around? Sorry, Celine. Yeah, <laughs> kind of, I don't know, yeah. I mean, you really like became a part of our lives. Uh, and I know that maybe it wasn't planned to be that way. And you know, there's a certain level of, of a barrier that you have, a boundary that you have to have between a journalist and a source. And we were aware of that. And of course, we sort of tried to push it as far as we could and be like, come hang out. But, um, <laughs> uh, but oh, so you had lines. <laughs> I guess, yeah. I mean, like, but I, I don't know. I never felt like you guys were pushing. I mean, the interesting thing about reporting on journalists is they also know the game, and I feel like you guys were still respectful of that. But it's hard also, if you spend a lot of time on any story, not to become at least sort of, like, friends, friendly with your sources, like, so people you're seeing all the time. Yeah, and I think through spending a lot of time with us, like, you really got to know us and sort of figured out how to navigate all of these different dynamics within the newsroom and how to tell this story well. But it's not like we weren't doing other interviews and it's not like we weren't being covered by anybody else. But yeah, Time, Ma Time Magazine was in there, I think, as well. But yes, but yeah, yeah. I, I was just going to say, like, nobody, like, nobody did it like this. Um, and just with the level of empathy and respect and really listening to us and hearing us and understanding what we were going through, there was, there's nothing else I've ever done. No one else I've ever talked to like that. Uh, like when I, I wrote a piece for Pointer about what it was like to be a journalist covering, uh, you know, covering things and then being covered. And I wrote like some of the basics of, uh, you know, the doorbell, uh, was really like triggering for me. And so like knocking on doors and ringing doorbells and how that can affect people or um, talking about if you're leading somebody into a dark space where you have to do that, then you have to bring them out of that dark space. And Chris always made sure to do that with me, um, even in the hardest, longest interviews that we had where it just felt like everything was hopeless. And we would, I would, a lot of us would say, like, I don't know how you're going to make this something that people want to listen to because um, it's really sad. Yeah. So that's, uh, I, we already have questions from the audience, so I want to get to that. But, but, you know, this is a narrative conference. So 
you must have had tons of material. How did you guys decide on a structure? Uh, a lot of trial, trial and error. error. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say there's like yeah. eight different versions. That's not maybe true, but like eight different versions. It feels like of each episode. More, maybe for more. Sure. I think oh this gosh. one had like 15 drafts for this first oh episode. Oh my gosh, yeah. But, um, I mean, this one was in really interesting in that. Mike, Mike. we went oh. around and around about this particular episode because I think at first, can we talk? I mean, is it okay to talk? You want to talk? I about think this? so. Yeah. Um, you know, we were like, we don't need to talk about the day. We don't need to talk about the thing, the terrible thing. Because the whole point of the series, if you listen to the whole series, if you haven't, please do, is what happens after the news cameras leave? What happens after the day? How do people get by? How do they go on? How do they do their jobs? How do they become people again? That's what we were so interested in. That's why we wanted to do this series so much. But it was like, for someone listening who hadn't followed the news coverage, we had to give them some kind of context. And how do you do that? How do you do that with the respect and the care that we wanted to take with this story? How do you do it without naming and putting the camera on the shooter? We're just not going to do that. We're not going to do it, right? So how do you do it? And you know, obviously, meeting Josh and hearing Josh's version of the day, um, again, we still, there were many drafts we, yeah. before we got to this, but it was like, let's tell most of the story from outside, right? Like we kept, if you think about the camera, like let's point the camera outside. We had to give you just a little bit of what happened inside, but not a whole bunch. I always think about what the detectives told you, like just look ahead, don't look down. We kind of kept that too, we thought of that too as how we told the story. Don't look down, don't tell people the blech. You know, how do we tell it from a little bit from the outside, from the people who are living it, from the people who felt it, for that one episode? But then with, the, I mean, the material of two years, you can take that question. That was question. like 300 hours of tape that you just kind of, like I had a spreadsheet where you try to like mark the interviews that, or the tape that seems like the most whatever. It's almost like hard to put a word to it, but just like either is the most emotional or telling or, or in some cases, believe it or not, funny or, you know, emotional. And then you start trying to build a structure from that. And there's like, and Celine and Danielle and even Olivia, who's here too, know this. And, uh, and Lily, who's also here. Like I, there's a lot of things that don't go into it, which is its own hard process. Like there were a lot of like we were almost going to do a whole paper or a whole episode about the first anniversary of the shooting, which is this whole thing that happens, and then that didn't quite work. So I think it's we, that's what we wanted to do, as Kelly's saying. Like that was my first idea was actually to not do an episode at all about the day, and when we tried doing that for people, it didn't. It, it wasn't quite working for people who were not familiar with it. And so honestly, the interview with Josh that makes up a large part of the first episode was done towards the end of the reporting, uh, was done in like late February or maybe mm. early March, 2020. Yeah. And then everything kind of shut down for a while and, and I had to set this aside for a bit. And so, yeah, I, I didn't, I, I don't know, that was the goal. And uh, in a lot of ways, not that this episode wasn't its own tricky thing, very tricky thing to put together. But the rest of it was um, was harder in a way um, because uh, like the aftermath of a tragedy is so much more like diffuse and kind of, it doesn't lend itself to a narrative that well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard to like, a, a tragedy is terrible and awful and hard to find a way to tell sort of sensitively, but it does have like a, you know, like it lays out like an arc and the other stuff is just messier and like yeah. not, anyway. So the first four episodes and then the fifth came later, but what was, was it an arc? Because normally the narrative structure is like this. Kind of. The second episode was more about like, I would say it was like about the first six months to a year afterward. Um, although like the timeline kind of jumps around a little bit, but that was a really tricky one. And then the third is more about the first attempt for the paper to kind of cover the trial of um, of the shooter itself, which was a very important thing to the editor in chief, Rick. Um, and then the fourth episode is more about the newspaper's problems under corporate ownership. Um, and then the fifth 
which happened much later because of many delays, is kind of about the, the trial finally happened in the summer of 2021. And did you become did you become his therapist in a way? That's what editors do, right? Oh. When you're going through something this long and you go so deep on it. Oh, I don't know, Chris. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I mean, it wasn't just me. It was um, our editor, um, Ali McAdam, and Lisa Pollack, and Nicole Beamsbrower, and another handful of people who worked on this with us. I mean, you know, you're going through these drafts and you're listening to tape and. You know, you're getting down in the weeds where you're like, no, this tape, no, that tape, no, this scene, no, that scene. But then, yeah, you do have to remind yourself to step back and be like, how are you? Are you OK? How's Celine? How's Danielle? How is everybody, how's everybody doing? How are you doing with the reporting of this? Um, yeah, I think we as journalists often, you know, try to think that um, our sources need the most um, care and time. Um, but, you know, I think we've learned over the years that we also need a little bit of time, too to be able to do this stuff, to be able to keep doing it. OK, I'm going to do the audience question. For Celine, how did experiencing this change, hmm, how did experiencing this change the way you approach stories about tragic events and people who survive them? Yeah, I mean, it was really eye-opening for me to have reporters start coming to my door, knocking on my door, and interacting with them from inside the house uh, when I had been the one knocking on doors and having that awful feeling of like, oh my God, I don't want to knock on this person's door. Why would anybody want their door to be knocked on? Nobody's going to want to talk to me this way. And then have it happen to me and realizing like, sometimes I thought I was just doing what I was assigned to be doing or I just had to do what my editor said even though it didn't feel good, or I thought maybe it just didn't feel good because I was covering something tragic, but really like I didn't realize I was like hurting people and that I did hurt people um, in some of the ways that I covered some traumatic events. Uh, and I, it changed everything I do in journalism uh, and how I interact with uh, sources and people that I'm covering and yeah, it changed everything, to answer your question. What should, what should they know? I mean, these are a bunch of people who may have to go knock on those doors after tragic things like that. I think part of it is for reporters to know, and then part of it is for editors to know, because there's only so much you can do as a reporter when you're being told, go knock on a door. I mean, I had been told in the past, like, I went and knocked on doors, nobody answered, and then it was like, you have to go back. Uh, and or like they didn't answer this time, go back again next week. Uh, so there's only so much you can do when you're being assigned something to convey, hey, this isn't right, um, or let's try it another way, or do we know what the implications of knocking on this person's door at this time are? Uh, and so I would say if you have this really, if you have a gut feeling that's like this is not good, um, I don't like this, I'm uncomfortable, like listen to that. Don't silence that because that's what I think old school journalism has taught us is that you just push through the feelings and you shove them down and then like you just become an alcoholic, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> but like, I mean, you know, like you become just like an old man who like, just smoking cigars and um, <laughs> like, you know, you could go to therapy instead. Um, <laughs> so yeah, listen to that voice because it's it's not just breaking out of your comfort zone. It's like, am I hurting people? Could I do this better? Is there, yeah, there's gonna just be times where you're uncomfortable. Like it's gonna happen. We were on, like you were uncomfortable, but you have to listen to that voice and say like, is there any way I can, do my job in a way that can not hurt this person anymore or in any way that can make it better. Like conversations that we had at the end of interviews that were just like, all right, listen, let's just like put this down for a second and like tell me about something else. Yep. Um, that is really valuable. And I wrote in that pointer piece, I think, and I really wanted to convey that the time that you spend with the recorder on or on the record or whatever you want to call it, like that is what's going to go into your story. But so much of what you do outside of that is what's going to make your story good or bad. And that's how you interact with somebody. It's how you treat them before and after an interview. Um, so 
put as much intention into the process of covering somebody as you do into choosing your questions or conducting that interview. Mm -hmm. Chris, how did you balance um, you know, journalism and showing your care? And you must have felt an incredible amount of responsibility because they were she was trusting you. All these people were trusting you. Uh, yes, yes is the answer to that. I, uh, yeah, but uh, like your question though before that was like, how do you balance the journalism with just like being a caring person, <laughs> like a like a good human? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how we should all treat people? Yeah, it's it's like I mean the the answer is what Selena's saying I think at the core, but like there's a real tension sometimes and I think the only way you can the only way I know how to do it is like you kind of just you have to w worry about it to a certain extent like don't make yourself sick with that but you like if you're not worried when you're handling like again they were kind enough to be like okay you're the like they did they had like the New York Times they had Washington Post they had other people who were coming to them to try to tell their story. And so when they go with you, that is like a, that's a very, that's like you have a lot of power and you have um, a lot of responsibility. So I think like that's a general answer. You have to kind of worry about it in that way. But I think the other thing that's tricky is that like in that first episode, the thing that is most of the episode, even though there's like a lot of details and there's a lot of reporting that went into it is um, Josh McCaro talking about his day, the photographer on the outside of the newsroom. And um, and part of the reason that he's like the main focus of that first episode is because he was very, like I think all mediums need this, but especially in radio, like we talk a lot about when someone's giving an interview about something that happened to them, whether they felt like in the moment, because you can kind of hear it when they're not in the moment. You know, you could just, the tape just doesn't work as well. You don't, it, you don't get that feeling and Josh, and we talked to some people who maybe started to, tr they said they were up, like we had a lot of conversations with them about like, are you up for talking about the day? And then we got there and they weren't. And like, that's completely fine. And we didn't, we stopped things. Uh, but Josh was willing to do that. And like, I feel grateful listening to it just now, like the last 30 minutes, but like, I know that takes a lot out of him. Like that, that can wreck a person for a day or two and like, I think you just have to be really careful, but you have to know that if you're gonna do that, I don't think there is a way to do it without that being like, at least somewhat emotionally draining is like a light word for it. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Mm -hmm. yeah, makes sense. Uh, maybe Kelly can help out with this one. Mental health is important to maintain in any job, especially for journalists. So what steps do you take to stay healthy in high stress situations? Not that you've been in many. <laughs> That's kind of a. Um, you know, I was thinking a lot about um, the DART Center on trauma and journalism. I mean, a huge touchstone for me and um, some of us, too. Um, we turned to them a lot. And when we were talking about the reporting of the series, we talked to them about it. Like, how do you do it? I mean, there's there's ways to do it and there's ways not to do it in terms of the reporting. You know, both, I mean, first and foremost, to make sure that you're giving your the person you're interviewing the most care, the most time, the most space possible, you know, just certain things like bring this, bring the interview back around to the point where they overcame the thing, the terrible thing they're talking about. I mean, that sounds so basic, but it's what you're talking about when you're interviewing people. Turn off the tape recorder. Talk about something completely different. I mean, just spend the time, right? And so. Um, They've been really good about that, but they're also really good about, you know, again, talking about what journalists need to do for their own self-care. Um, because again, we think that our sources are more important than we are. Um, why would anybody care about me? I'm not the one, This I'm fine. But I had a great therapist tell me once, like that's like being in the hospital and being like, well, I've got a broken leg and this guy has cancer. Only treat the guy who has cancer and don't treat my broken leg. But like, so you do have to actually at some point deal with your own broken leg so that you can keep doing the job, right? Because that's what's most important to us, right? Is the job, is telling, being able to tell these stories. So learning how to just 
take breaks, go on walks, you know, after an interview like that. I mean, to me, like, it's like having those meaningful conversations with the person I'm interviewing, actually. Go on a walk, look at some flowers, you know, just breathe, drink some coffee, you know, be out there. But then, yeah, just take time to process and reflect um, is super important, too. It must have been, I mean, the two things happening in your life, talking to people about a mass shooting and then having a birth. Yeah. You know, having a child before. <laughs> yeah. And he didn't even name his kid after me. I know. <laughs> well, we do have, uh, secretly, my son's name is San. He doesn't know it yet. San from Celine San Felice. Anyway, that's, a, that was, that's actually, that was the deal. That was what cinched the interview, actually, in the beginning. She's like, okay, fine. I you promise to name your firstborn you after first me. Born. That was oh it. My God. That's the trick, everybody, <laughs> if you're wondering. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot. W weirdly, I think... Uh, it wasn't until after these episodes, like we came out in the summer afterward, we did another episode. Uh, the trial, the much delayed trial of the of the shooter, like happened, and I went to that in Annapolis. Um, and honestly, it was like driving home from one day of testimony that was particularly uh, terrible. Uh, that like it, I don't know why. That's like when it hit me. I do think it's easy to like put it aside or when you're in the middle of reporting a lot on a tragic thing like I, this isn't a, like a very concrete answer about how you do that but I think the truth is like you know the part of your brain that got you into the story that like is that cares and is deeply empathetic and feels all the feeling or at least a lot of the feelings then there's like your like editor brain right that like has to be like think how do I put the pieces of this like puzzle like I think we all any journalist does that like, I think that part of the brain, like, you need it, but if it runs for too long, like, you start just almost forgetting, like, what it is. And I do think there were times that I would tell people, like, oh, yeah, we're working on this episode about this thing that, like, didn't, it, like, I would spent two years, and it would just be, like, a little detail. And so I'd tell someone, and they'd, like, gasp, and I'd realize, like, oh, right, like, I've kind of almost, like, lost a compass or something about, yeah. Uh, did you, was Celine, like, talking to you about the drafts and things like that. How collaborative was it? And, and could this be a model that could happen at other times? And did you think about that? Like how much you wanted Celine to have access to, you know, we, the final product? We probably could have, I feel like a lot more, but we didn't, like our process was that the closest thing to that, and I don't know if it was done right, and it might've been done in some cases too late, is like, I would let, as many people as I could know before the episode came out, because we were often changing them like up to the last minute. Like, hi, here's an email. Like, here's what the episode tomorrow is gonna have. Like, the gist of it, kind of. Like, here's how it's gonna go. If you don't, you know, if you don't want to listen, like, totally understand. If you want to skip this part, it's about this far into the episode. You know what I mean? So. We did that, but I don't think like we weren't bringing Celine in. Well, and also I wouldn't let somebody read a story I don't, of mine, yeah. you know. Yeah. 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 Like she never was like asking. Yeah, we to, kept it pretty. We stuck to the as as much as a collaborative as we tried to be with the reporting. Um, we stuck to pretty strict journalism rules on the on the writing and sharing of scripts. But beforehand. I do want to say like the the care that went into okay, this episode's going to come out and it's yeah. going to have this and that and I mean it was those emails were really detailed and it's like I'm going to send you an email. It's not just like well I sent them an email. Uh like you're dealing with people who have a lot on their plate and like that it's taking the extra step with people who are traumatized and like having a, a variety of mental health issues to not just trust like, well, I sent an email, you know, it's, it's much more than that. And we felt like it wasn't just, okay, I'm done with my interviews. I'm doing my story now, you know, you go away. But, yeah. Like, but I mean, I think part, uh, some of the hardest things is the stuff that doesn't go in. You are like, oh, we talked about that for four hours. And you know, you like write the email and just like, hey, listen, you know, for a bunch of reasons, this is, did, it, you're not gonna hear this part in mm -hmm. here, but I mean, sometimes even trying to talk about why, I, you know, I don't know if you did on this series, but I mean, that's something that we definitely do um, in our stories. Yeah, there's just stuff that doesn't make it, and there's stuff that like you, and a lot of that is like very conscious decisions about what you decide to lose and keep, and then there's literally just like things that I, almost like wish I'd kept in and then like you just you just realize like oh crap like I forgot like nothing wrong or un like but just 
there's a lot going on. And I do, that's like why you need an editor. I mean, that didn't happen too many times, but I think like it's just too much for one person to sit with. And so Kelly and the other editors I worked with were pretty good about that. Yeah. What were you thinking when you were listening to it just now? To the first episode? Yeah. Oh, uh, it's funny. I don't know if anyone else says this. Like when you listen to a thing you did, you can hear all the things you would yeah. have like done differently or something like That's that. That's why I don't want to listen. Oh, we were over there whispering to each other like, oh, that was that line oh, that, that so-and-so made what? us put in. And that was that post that blah, blah, blah. But, you know. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't like I, I don't feel bad about the episode like as a whole. But, no. yeah, I can't help but hear those like little, little things. Those weird things. Uh, I want to reflect a little bit on newsrooms because this is a lot about, I mean, newsrooms have been a home for so many of us. And you explain that like incredibly in the series about, you know, the characters that you meet in a newsroom and the bonds you develop in a newsroom and how it becomes your home. And I mean, it seems like the pandemic took that away. Um, and you had the shootings before that, but it's well, it wasn't just a pandemic, but yeah, yeah. Corporate ownership had something to do with it. You said that. So, <laughs> so uh, can I can I give away that detail Please. for anyone who's like on the edge of their seat? Uh, like, <laughs> basically, eventually, well, ever, they started going remote, like everyone else did in March 2020. Later in the summer of 2020, right? Uh, Tribune Publishing, which at the time owned the Capitol, actually permanently closed the newsroom and and the newsrooms of other um, newspapers. So there was no longer, the Capitol no longer has an actual newsroom, even though they had just gotten a new one after the shooting. And even though the newsroom was the target of this horrific right. day. I mean, it's, it was symbolically awful. It was awful for so many reasons. And you all reflected that in the stories that you told us, and we really wanted to reflect that in one of the episodes. Um, boy, did we rewrite that episode a bunch of times. Yes. <laughs> yes. But um, really just wanted to, you know, because there were the buyouts and there was all this stuff, but it was like corporate stuff happening, boardrooms, meetings, investors, whatever. But to us, the, 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 the heart of what was really going on was the loss of that physical space for you all. And that was the choice that we made on that episode to start that episode with that, even though it was a little bit chronologically out of order. At one point, it was about the buyouts, and it was Danielle going into Rick's office being like, what the, you know? And then it was like, buyout. But so that was in there, but we just, you know, it was like, again, it's like, which things that Chris has witnessed over these two years, what are the things that um, resonate, that matter, that resonate to them? that are gonna make people care about this. You know, those are the choices that we're making when we're telling the story. Did you wanna say something? I mean, just that like, the newsroom meant so much to us in so many different ways and it became so many different things. You had the newsroom at 888 Bestgate where, you know, people died and we got that ripped away from us in one way. And then we were in like this tiny little opera house uh, building and all crammed together, and we thought we were just gonna be there for a week or two weeks or three weeks, and then it was a year. Um, and that became something to us. And then we had this other office, and you know, we finally had like a home of our own, and it was you know, as luxurious as a high security newsroom can be. Mm. Um, and then that got ripped away from us. And then like eventually, all we had left was each other, and then as we felt, as we lost the ability to continue working at that company, um, that felt like it got ripped away from us. Uh, but we still do have each other, like through all of this. Um, and yeah. And I think that's a quote in the fourth episode. We survived a mass shooting, but we couldn't survive a corporation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Danielle, actually, yeah, over there says Danielle, that. That's your quote, Danielle. <laughs> I remember uh, that one. Yeah, I know. Putting I'll over. never forget that I one. Know. We're like, uh, oh, the boom. quote was slightly, it was something to the effect of, like, we've, so, yeah, the craziest thing is that we've survived a mass shooting, and I'm not sure we're going to be able to survive corporate ownership. And, uh, yep. yeah, that was like the quote was like the, the heart of that episode. Uh, they, they tried. The, the paper is, is still exists, but it is like in a much diminished form and it continues to be diminished. And this was hard to fit into the episodes, but they worked like, I think they would have worked very hard if none of this, you know, the, this attack had never happened, but they worked so much harder 
to try to save it after and watching that like that's the sort of thing that is like a it's like a different kind of tragedy and watching that happen was really hard but they but they do still like i think that to be clear i think there is like a a legacy that lives on through the people even if like the newsroom and a lot of the resources have been stripped away mm. did you reflect on that at all while you were doing this because you had the resources to be there for two years. Yes, I was extremely lucky. And you were talking to people who were extremely unlucky. And res I mean, and that's something that's in our industry now. There are some people that have lots of resources yeah. and some people that are, have less and less resources every day. Yeah, no, I thought about that a lot. Like, I feel incredibly lucky. A lot of people would love to be able to spend two years more or less working on one thing. I mean, there were a few other things here and there, but like, I could drive down to Annapolis for like two or three days a week and spend most of my, like that is an incredible luxury that so few journalists have. So when you're also doing a story that is observing journalists who have like not even a newsroom anymore and are having to do so many stories on, on just frankly unfairly low pay, like it, it's, yeah, you think about that. Um, like, I don't know what to myself to do about that to fix that problem, mm -hmm. but like that is that was a real thing. I saw something on your face. Did you you me? Yeah. Oh, I mean, we don't, and that's not even something that we could do at Embedded even now. You know, I mean, that was a minute right. when we could do NPR that. NPR is about yeah. to go through. Yeah, I mean, NPR is, you know, so, on Thursday, you know, like I, Embedded might not exist. I don't even know. Like, you know, I mean, they're in the middle of laying off 10% of the staff at NPR um, this week. So. Yeah, it was, but I do there was a say, moment like, I mean, when you get the moment, take it, do the story, you know, because you never know, like definitely do the story, you know, do the story that's going to like, yeah, you know, but, still have resonance. Yeah, but newspaper, I mean, there's like nothing, right. I mean, NPR is really hurting right now, but newspapers have been hurting for a right. really long time. So. Right. Uh. Find that down. So, right? And there was a minute when, you know, we talked about doing the series from the beginning. I mean, I remember the very, I mean, the day it happened, um, we were all, of course, like, watching the news unfold. And our, actually, one of our editor, our colleague, you know, she had worked with Rob Hyacin, and she had sort of had the thought about doing this series in the beginning. And um, when we knew that it was a series about not going away, you know, staying after the news cameras leave, not forgetting about us, as Celine um, encourages us to do. We knew that it was going to be a story about, you know, journalism, too. And it was like, oh, is that too inside baseball? Is it too navel gazy? You know, journalists talking about journalists, boring, boring, boring. But like, this is America, you know, I mean, this is what's happening. You don't have a newspaper, you don't have a lot of stuff. You know, the, the home of the week, you know, the, the guide, the political guide that you were writing, that is important stuff. And so, like, we felt like that was important to say. And if we told it in the right way, it wouldn't seem too, like, oh, poor us. Feel sorry for all of us poor journalists. Mm -hmm. Maybe that was true, but I don't really care what anybody thinks anymore. So, <laughs> um, I think it was in the fourth episode, there was this, maybe the fifth, there's this amazing moment where Celine is testifying. And she turns to him, mm -hmm. the killer, and looks him in the eye and says, you know, I went to work the next day. You know, you can't shoot the truth. Yeah. But, you're, uh, but the, it's so bittersweet what you were living. You were living, you know, a diminishing paper. And at the same time, you're like fighting for the nobility of truth and the nobility of the profession. Do you just have to live with those two things together? Yeah. I mean, this, like, this shooting didn't happen at the New York Times, the Washington Post, or NPR. Like, it happened to the Capitol. And, you know, I don't like to talk about, like, you know, the inside of that newsroom and what that was like, but it was like, this is happening to us. Like, nobody cares about us. Uh, and we had this moment where just for a little while, people really cared about the Capitol. And uh, we had to hold that up, even when like we couldn't even hold ourselves up. Um, and it was like we would go out and just try and do the regular stories we were doing. I mean, it's not like we switched gears to start doing 
anything drastically different. Um, but we would go out and just try and cover like uh, the governor's mansion is decorated for Christmas. And then we have like, how are you doing? And oh my gosh, I knew Wendy and everybody knew Wendy. Um, but uh, <laughs> but Wendy. yeah, it, it so yeah, it was really hard to have to go through that. Um, but also at the same time, we were being listened to and there are a lot of little newspapers out there who people feel like nobody cares about us um, and we're gonna go under and nobody's gonna care. And so if you cared about the Capitol, you should care about all those other little newspapers and all those other reporters um, who were just like, just like us. Yeah. Uh, how has the podcast been received by you and the crew, the former Gazette? Well, I mean, I'm not here because I hate it. Um, <laughs> It'd be awkward, but you can read. Super awkward. This was bad. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. You're, I feel like on the, here you're expected to be like, we're talking very positively about yeah. it. But like, I know that not everyone felt only positive feelings yeah. about it. I well, I mean, I can't speak for other people, but I can say that I, we all knew you were tasked with something that was impossible in like covering even a small newsroom has a lot of different dynamics a lot of different aspects and angles and um it's all very like news forward you know uh but also there are people who are covering sports and photographers and and people who just and the families and the outer just the whole rings of this that you know i think some people would have just wanted more um but you gave us everything you could. And um, I mean, I'm speaking as somebody who was featured a lot in it and I have that privilege. And so um, I feel heard and that's like, when people ask me, you know, what was it like? I can just be like, listen to this. And that is not something I can do with any other coverage. I can't do that with even some of the biggest outlets that covered us. Um, and it's not because they didn't do a good job, but it's because you guys, as much as was possible, you told the entire story. Yeah, I mean, the thing that I didn't know that I was getting into until it was like maybe a year or two in, like there were new reporters like uh, Lily, who's in the audience here, who came on. Like there's a real churn at anyone who's been at a local newspaper. There's a lot of people coming in and, and out. And I, in the beginning, I was trying to talk to everyone and pretty soon I realized like I actually stopped spending too much time with new people which I feel conflicted about a little bit but I was like I don't know if this is going to go in the story and I don't know that I should make you sit through and like mm -hmm. I don't even know the number of hours that Celine, Danielle, some other people I made them like sit through interviews and I was like I, I think the story is going to be about this and that's a lot narrower than what the whole reality of the newsroom is, which always happens with stories. But like, then how much of this other person's time do you want to take if there's like a smaller chance that they're going to fit in, even though they have a totally legit, interesting story themselves? So like, that was a hard part of it. Is like, it, the, the the series does not. It is not a comprehensive look at the newspaper. Like, it is picking certain stories and storylines, and that leaves certain things out, which is always kind of hard. Anyway. I need to ask a last question because we're getting to the end of our time. Uh, it seems like one of the fundamental questions and is answered in the series, tell me if I'm wrong, but just is it worth it? I mean, anything, anything we put out there could set someone off. Like, uh, Why does it continue to be worth it every day? Kelly? Journalism? <laughs> is yeah. it, is and taking this risk of telling the truth at a time when hate crimes are up and shootings are up and yeah. yeah. And do you do you mean like I just want to? There's a lot of people in here who probably haven't heard right. This the, this is the only episode you've heard for some of the people in here. Just to explain, we don't go into it. The shooter's motives had to do with an old story, and it's a whole thing that's not worth getting too far into. But uh, the shooter was unhappy with the paper's coverage of him and tried a lot of different avenues and uh, before doing this. So I think that's what you mean. Yeah, sorry, uh, thank you. I mean, I have to, I, I don't know. I want to know what go Celine ahead, thinks. Go. But I say, yeah, like, obviously, uh, you should keep doing journalism. And But uh, I, that's easy for me to say. 
please. Don't. Everybody quit. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> Just kidding, please don't. Terrible, John. Uh, I mean, if it wasn't worth it, I wouldn't have gone back to work the next day, and I wouldn't have kept going back to work. And um, I left the Capitol because I thought journalism was worth it, and I wanted to do the best journalism I possibly could, um, just in a way that I could continue sustaining that. And so um, even though I'm not there right now, it's still worth it. Uh, and it's really easy to give up. Like, it's really easy to just throw in the towel and just get tired with everything that's going on. I live in um, this third world country called Florida right now. <laughs> um, Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, you see why I wanted to interview Celine? She's so interesting <laughs> to talk to you know? for a long time. Anyway. Sorry. I mean uh, that, anyway. I live, in, I live in Florida right now where um, I am covering a lot of really heavy stuff. I, uh, you know, sometimes I check my email. I just hit 29,000 emails uh, and probably many more by now. But um, I look at what's going on and I just sort of freeze up. And like, yeah, it can be really easy to just say, this is too much, I can't do it. Um, or it can be really easy to say, like, I'm tired of um, writing for this little tiny paper. What does this matter? Uh, but it does matter. And people's stories, especially at the little paper, especially in your local news outlet, it's the only time those people will get their stories told. And it's your responsibility to tell them. So I hope that if you're doing this job, if you don't think it's worth it, then you should leave. I said this quote today at um, WBUR, but I, and I say it all the time. We tell ourselves stories in order to live. It's Joan Didion quote, right? Like, we are sitting in a room, all of us together, looking at each other in the eye, talking about trauma and survival and journalism. You know, years later, years after we made this story, I mean, that's why we do it. That is why we do it. So we can be better at being alive. You know, that's why I do it. I'll do it till the day I die for that very reason. So unequivocally, yes, it is worth it. Thank you, guys. Celine. Thank you. you. Thanks so much. Uh, another round of applause for this amazing panel. Thank you, Rupa, Chris, Celine, and Kelly. I can't think of a better keynote or way to uh, start the BU Power of Narrative Conference. Mariette, your words are so on about stories and narrative, and Kelly, you're just reinforcing that. And what a room full of journalists and future journalists. This is such a great audience to hear this podcast and to hear this panel. I, since I have you captive, I just, it's an opportunity to just highlight another important and fascinating podcast that is launching next week at WBUR. It's called Violation, and it's a partnership with the Marshall Project and WBUR, and it is about the fatal stabbing at a summer camp in 1986. It tells the story of two families devastated by the crime and also pulls back the curtain on parole boards, powerful, secretive, largely political bodies that control the fates of thousands of people every year. You can hear excerpts on NPR's Here and Now. Again, another long-form piece of journalism podcast. Please download and listen. And finally, I want to alert you to a conversation we are having here at City Space on March 27th, Monday, 6.30 p.m. with David Hogg the student who survived the Marjorie Stoneman, Stoneman Douglas High School shootings and has become a major activist in the gun control movement. And you can find tickets at wbur.org events. Thank you again. Thank you for being here. Thank you.